Hi. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about Gina Grams today. So in the spirit of that, let's just get right to it. And I'll share my screen. I have a, a PowerPoint for you. And it's titled, Gina Grams, What's in Your Closet? Uh, and as you see, this lady opens up uh, her closet, and there's lots of skeletons in it. Uh, Gina Graham is something that we use to gather information about families. And uh, just before we start into that, it's probably a good idea to, con to consider what we know about families, what they are, how they function, and cultures. Uh, and families serve uh, specific uh, purposes. Actually, they serve specific purposes in all cultures, and we'll look into that a little bit too. Uh, they provide safety. Uh, a pregnant woman and a child uh, who's with child has uh, uh, historically been, um, you know, pretty uh, at risk for environmental factors lions and tigers and bears, uh, you know, hunting and gathering. So families, groups, herds for all creatures that uh, bond together in family units provide safety. Uh, for human beings, is also a way for us to consolidate wealth and property, to provide for inheritance. Uh, to create identity, us's and them's, and to provide continuation in terms of names and bloodline and all of that good stuff. Uh, so, genograms reveal a lot about how we organize uh, our family units and how they function. A genogram is a two-dimensional representation of a family. And it provides a graphic example of lineage, who begat whom, of relationships, of behaviors. It helps us to identify illness uh, that uh, exists within a bloodline, within a family system. And uh, it helps us to identify belief systems, what they are and where they came from. And just about anything that, they, that can be described in terms of a system. Uh, and what do they look like? Uh, well, let's see. This uh, link takes you to genogram templates, uh, and you can get four generational genograms here, and this kind of thing. Uh, Genograms are represented, this would, uh, squares are male, circles are female. So here's uh, Adam and Eve and uh, Cain and Abel and their daughter, whose name I forget, uh, you know. And uh, this is a, a family of origin here for these kids. This is a nuclear family for this group. The man and the woman who come together uh, are a marital subset, and when they get married and have children, then they become a parental subset. Uh, this is the nuclear family. The, uh, when you talk about uh, the, fam the children, uh, then this is the family of origin. That's the family that you're born into. The nuclear family is one that you form when you uh, grow up and hook up and have kids. Uh, and this is, again, it's a two-dimensional representation of things. When you're looking at the family, you can, for instance, identify, say, dad was an alcoholic, mom was a codependent, dad died of cancer, uh, uh, oldest brother, uh, you know, died of cancer. Youngest daughter died of cancer. You can, uh, uh, diabetes, heart disease, alcoholism, drug dependency. All of this shows up in the family of origin when you start looking for things. And so you can use this as a tool to identify, uh, uh, 
risk for illness, to identify behavioral risk, to identify uh, family traditions behaviorally, as a matter of fact. When you start looking at families, if you were to say, looking for politics, you'll find going down the family uh, that a lot of people get their political beliefs, their beliefs about, so about society, their beliefs about religion, and things like that taught to them in this, and we are indoctrinated in family rules. This structure becomes a mean of deploying power and for education and for uh, discipline and for all kinds of things. I deviated a little bit there. Uh, and that schematic is something that you can use. And uh, Dr. Kaufman will talk to you about it in her family class too when you get there about how to, how to utilize uh, a genogram. Uh, and when we're, when we're looking at families, uh, families help us formulate our identity, our, uh, the way we view ourselves, who we are and what we are in the world and thus and so begat thus and thus. And the Bible is one of the more uh, uh, probably familiar uh, uh, genetic record that we have, family record uh, that we have. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the family of, um, of uh, uh, I can't remember his name now, Abraham. <laughs> there. Uh, meanwhile, in Ireland, uh, prehistoric Macarons were begetting all over the place, too. That's my mother's people. Uh, and uh, we, uh, our lineage there can be traced back to Fergus, Fergus Moore McGurk. Uh, and uh, that's a long time back. Uh, in Deutschland, Bushards gab out, but more on that later. But Bushards were also uh, begotten over there, and that's where uh, my father's people originated from, uh, our family name. And uh, the uh, first of my lineage in America was uh, Jacob Bushart, who, uh, who um, immigrated here from Belgium. Uh, before the Revolutionary War. The, uh, uh, we also have a concept of, uh, of uh, uh, responsibility of families. We have myths around families, and uh, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, traits, uh, that are passed down in families, behaviors that are passed down in families. In the house of Atreus in Greece, uh, there was a blood curse that was passed down in families where the sins of the fathers were visited upon the sons. And I'm gonna make this real quick. Uh, uh, Tantalus uh, was a titan. He uh, sinned against uh, uh, against Zeus and the gods. He was a greedy person. He wound up in um, uh, his torture in hell. Was He was uh, uh, chest deep in the river and very thirsty. But every time he bent down to get a drink, the water would recede away from him. And he was very hungry. And every time he reached up to grasp some of the f fruit that was hanging on the uh, bowels, the, the, the bowels would rise up to where he couldn't reach them. Uh, and that's where we got our um, uh, verb to tantalize, uh, to, to tease someone and not let them have it. Uh, Thyestes was a son of his, Atreus was a son of his. Atreus uh, was the younger brother, Thyestes the older. This is kind of a Greek version of Cain and Abel. Uh, uh, the uh, children of Thyestes, uh, Thyestes, Pelops, and Justus, um, they were um, uh, princes and they were going to inherit their father's crown. Uh, but Atreus wanted it. And so Atreus 
murdered the children, invited Thyestes to a barbecue, fed him his children to get rid of the evidence. Uh, Thyestes killed himself and Atreus became uh, king. Agamemnon uh, was one of the children of uh, Atreus, and Agamemnon went on to become, uh, to become king of Thebes. Uh, Menelaus uh, became the king of Sparta. Y'all may have seen this in the movie Troy. Uh, meanwhile, in Sparta, uh, uh, Leto, uh, who became a mother of queens, was seduced by Zeus, who kind of raped her while he was a swan, uh, and consequently impregnated her. And so Leto, uh, the queen and wife of Tyndareus, has an egg or two. And uh, in one egg, Castor and Pollux, they're the Dioscuri, uh, and they were demigods that went on to live in uh, Olympus and have adventures of their own. Uh, but it was their two daughters uh, that uh, we uh, need to kind of focus on, and that's Helen and Clytemnestra, and they were women to be reckoned with. Kingdoms are united and individuals are destroyed because Agamemnon, uh, the king of Mycenae, marries the Spartan princess Clytemnestra, and he becomes uh, uh, and makes her his queen. Menelaus, the prince of uh, Mycenae, marries the Spartan queen Helen, and he becomes the king of Sparta. Two uh, kingdoms are united by blood now. They're sisters who married brothers, right? Both increase wealth, territory, military might, all of that good stuff. But what does this actually do in terms of relationship when you have brothers marrying sisters and then, you know, they become their own brother-in-laws and things begin to get a little muddied up there. Vendetta comes out of this. The, uh, the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The, uh, the children of Atreus bear the sins of their father who murdered his nephews and fed them to his brother. Helen cheats with the Trojan prince Paris uh, and runs away with him, which sets the stage for the uh, Trojan War. Uh, it wasn't so much that uh, uh, that uh, the king of Sparta was uh, uh, in love so much with uh, Helen. It was the fact that he had uh, put the princes of Troy up in his house and treated them well, and they did not return his courtesy. Um, so uh, he decides that he's going to go to war with them, and he calls upon his brother, the king of, uh, uh, of Thebes, Agamemnon, to uh, go with him to uh, avenge his honor. And so, um, and a bunch of other kings too. But this uh, brought about a problem because Agamemnon uh, went to see the oracle at Delphi. And the oracle at Delphi uh, never gives you good news. Uh, and uh, he had to, um, in order to be successful in the Trojan War, he had to sacrifice his eldest daughter to Poseidon. And that was Iphigenia. Iphigenia uh, was put to death, uh, and her father went away to fight the Trojan War, and indeed he was uh, victorious. Took a long time, took the Greeks ten years to bring down Ilium. Uh, and um, when uh, Agamemnon, was, uh, Agamemnon was away, uh, Clytemnestra took up uh, with Aegisthus, uh, someone who was not her husband. Uh, and she was rightfully put out because Agamemnon had uh, murdered her daughter, had sacrificed her daughter. Uh, and this bound her as a mother uh, to avenge the death of her child. But in order to avenge the death of her child, she had to uh, uh, murder Agamemnon which uh, she and Aegisthus did. 
you know, when he came home from the Trojan War, she said, gee, honey, it must have been a long day at the office. Let me pour you a glass of wine and draw you a hot bath, uh, which she did. And uh, Aegisthus and Clytemnestra uh, hacked him to pieces with swords while he was doing that. This brought about a quandary for Orestes and Electra, who were the children of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. Orestes was uh, not really wanting to do much of anything about this. You know, what's done is done, no point crying over uh, spilt milk, but uh, Electra wouldn't hear of it. She pushed him and pushed him uh, in his duty as a son and a prince. He was duty-bound as a son to avenge the murder of his father. And he was duty-bound as a prince to uh, defend the assassination of the head of state, who also happened to be his father. Uh, so Orestes had to act. This was part of the Greek ethos. So when he acted, uh, he had to kill his mother. Uh, and he did. He put Clytemnestra and Aegisthus most to death. Uh, but this didn't end things. The, it wasn't over. Uh, Orestes was now in trouble with the Furies, the household gods and uh, goddesses. And the uh, Furies protected the house and the home, and they protected mothers. Uh, and anyone who committed the high, heinous uh, crime of matricide, who spilled mother blood, uh, was subject to being pursued by the Furies. And pursue Orestes, they did. Uh, and the Furies uh, drove men mad before they destroyed them. Orestes fled to get away from him, and he fled to the temple of Athena. Uh, and when he got there, she tried to give him shelter. Uh, and the Furies uh, kind of uh, basically drew a line in the sand with Athena and said, look, you may outrank us as a goddess, but this is, this is you know, our dominion. Uh, uh, we get to decide what happens with Orestes because he spilled mother blood and he's, he's ours to do with as we wish. And the goddess came up with an idea. She said that everyone involved was going to get to tell their side of the story. Uh, and when all of the evidence was presented, she had six mortals and six gods uh, who uh, cast their votes. Uh, a white ball, uh, for uh, uh, exoneration was dropped into a bowl and a black ball uh, for, uh, uh, for finding him guilty uh, was uh, dropped in the bowl. And when the balls were counted, there were six white ones and six black ones. It seemed that the jury was divided between acquittal and uh, conviction. And the goddess voted, and she said, "Whenever there's, we can't decide. Whenever this is, uh, uh, is um, the situation, then the goddess will vote. And the goddess always votes for acquittal. Uh, she always votes to let the uh, the uh, uh, person off to to um, to acquit them." Uh, if there is an evidence to convict them. And that's where we get the symbol of justice, by the way, uh, who's holding the scales, weighing the evidence with a blindfold around her eyes because uh, justice uh, is not a respecter of persons. She just weighs the evidence. Uh, and she's got the sword, and the sword can either cut the binds that bind the prisoner or put the prisoner to death. Uh, interesting, huh? Uh, what's it got to do with families? Uh, well, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Grief ethics is kind for kind. Justice, morality, and family ties are a conflict in that story. There's a loss of identity in that story. And for the Greeks, the family was a source of identity, just as it is for Europeans and Asians and the uh, 
uh, uh, cultures all over the world. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, is a sculpture. I don't know what he really looked like. The sculptor probably didn't either, but this is a rep representation of the great poet and playwright Aeschylus. Uh, and uh, the, the inscription on his tomb uh, said, Beneath the stone lies Aeschylus, son of Euphorion, who smote the long-haired Persian at Marathon. The Persian remembers and can speak of it. Uh, this was Aeschylus's identity. He was a member of the Greek Senate. He uh, made laws. He was wealthy. He was a successful traitor. He wrote plays and poetry and produced plays. Uh, uh, all, uh, he was a family man, had sons and daughters, had all kinds of stuff. But the way he was remembered is, beneath the stone lies Aeschylus, son, son of Euphorion, who smoked the long-haired Persian. <laughs> you know, that was his... Uh, uh, identity and who he was, Aeschylus the son, Aeschylus the soldier. Family ties define us, and if you think about it, uh, you know, who we are, uh, terms we use like son, husband, father, all of that defines family relationship. Uh, another short fable here is House of Thebes and how family ties define us. Uh, so, uh, all of these imply what? If you're a father, you have children. If you're a mother, you have children. If you're a daughter, you have parents. If you're a son, you have parents. If you are a widow, you've lost someone. If you're married, you have in-laws. If you're an in-law, then your children are married. If you're a stepmom, if you're an orphan, if you're a husband, all of that defines someone. Then there is no name for me. Uh, and that's for a parent who's lost a child. Uh, and uh, parents who've lost children, we don't have a, a name uh, for them. Uh, as one of the characters on Six Feet Under said one time, to lose a child is so effing horrible that there, we don't even want to think about it. <laughs> no, there is no name for it. Zeus is the horny god of, uh, uh, a chief god of the uh, Greek, uh, of, of Olympus, of the, of the Greek pantheon. Uh, he's the father of Ares, Aphrodite, Apollo, Cadmus, from, uh, you know, that, that a lot of people descend from Zeus. And he really has, he's married to his sister, by the way. Uh, uh, so Hera is his wife and his sister. And if you uh, look at all the little begats in history, including the ones in the Bible, uh, you know, you can't read very far before you can go, hmm, incest. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, which is true, uh, you know. Uh, who was Cain's wife? Uh, you know, there are variations on that story, but uh, logic would tell us if Adam and Eve were the only people on Earth, then uh, Cain's wife was his sister or his mother. Uh, anyway, the uh, uh, there's a there's a handy catch all for that. He left the Garden of Eden and uh, uh, went, to, went to east of Eden and found a bride. But that's something else. Anyway, the, the uh, descendants of, uh, of Zeus through these gods, demigods, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, mortals comes down to here which is the important part of this. Oedipus, which means crippled foot, and Jocasta uh, are married and have Polynesus, Eteocles, Ismene, and Antigone, their children. Now, the problem with this is uh, that you should never, ever, ever visit the Oracle at Delphi. 
uh, because Laius went there, the father of uh, Oedipus uh, and the husband of Queen Jocasta, uh, went there and was told, well, there's some good news and bad news about the child that he's expecting. Uh, the child will, uh, will, he, he will have an heir. He will be a prince, uh, a boy child. He will grow up and he'll murder you uh, and he'll plow your fields and have children with his mother. Uh, and this was horrific. I mean, the, what a terrible uh, prognostication, right? Uh, and this begins to sound a little bit like Snow White now because the king calls in a huntsman, tells him to take to the child to the mountain, the herdsman, uh, pierce his ankles, bind his feet, and leave him up on the mountain for the, uh, for the wild beast. Although why you would have to bind a newborn's feet is beyond me, but that's, I didn't write it. Uh, the um, uh, herdsman was soft-hearted, uh, and though the child's uh, feet were pierced at the ankle and bound, um, he took the child up on the mountain, and then he took the child down on the other side of the mountain uh, to another kingdom, uh, to the king and queen, uh, Perobos and Mariope. Uh, and uh, told him, you know, here's a child of royal blood, Periobos and uh, Mariope couldn't have children, uh, and uh, gave him to, to them, and they raised him as his own son, and, well, he became known as Oedipus, the cripple foot. Uh, it was some bad news and some worse news for Oedipus, who went to uh, the oracle at Delphi, and the oracle told him uh, the same thing that he had told his father. You're going to grow up. Uh, you're going to kill your father and marry your mother and have children with her. Uh, this horrified Oedipus. Uh, I might pause here a minute to say that Oedipus was a good man. All of his life, he was a good man. He was a righteous man, an honest man, a fair man, a brave man. Uh, and uh, Everything about Oedipus was to be admired. And so because he was horrified by this news that he got at Delphi, he never returned to, uh, uh, to the kingdom of Parabos and Mariope. Uh, he went instead to Thebes, where uh, Laius was the king at the time. And while he was traveling through this strange land that he knew nothing about and had no idea he was a prince of, he met a crotchety old man in a chariot, and they got into an argument, and the guy jumped off and uh, the chariot and basically attacked him, and uh, uh, Oedipus smacked him over the head with his stick and uh, killed him. Uh, guess who that was? <laughs> It, uh, Oedipus had no idea, but it was the king, and he had, uh, he had killed by us. Uh, and now as he goes on into the city, he finds out that there's a curse on the city. There's a phoenix outside uh, the uh, city that has put a curse on it. Uh, and the phoenix asks a riddle, and anyone who could solve the riddle would lift the curse. And the riddle was, what goes on four legs in the morning two legs at midday, and three legs uh, at night. And Oedipus uh, was up to the task. He said, as a, as, as a man through his lifetime, he's, when he's a baby, he goes on all fours. In his prime, he walks upright. When he's old, he walks with a stick. Uh, and this lifted the curse. The phoenix burst into flames and... Uh, Oedipus went in and was rewarded by winding up king of the kingdom and married to uh, Jocasta, who little uh, did he know was his mother. Uh, and they began to have children. Who am I? Oedipus is his own stepbrother. His wife is his mother. His children are his brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews. Jocasta is grandmother to her children, husband to her son. And there are other combinations that are equally baffling. Identity is destroyed 
through incest, through uh, marrying and copulating and reproducing within the family. Uh, the kingdom eventually falls. Uh, Oedipus discovers uh, who he is. He questions Tiresias, the blind seer, and the herdsman also who left him up on the mountain. And they begged him, uh, don't, don't go any further with this. Don't tell us, uh, don't ask us any more questions because we're on the verge of dreadful telling. And uh, Oedipus told him, I'm on the verge of dreadful hearing, but I gotta know this. And so he did. Uh, his uh, wife, mother, went off screen and hanged herself. Oedipus took the brooch from her dress and blinded himself. He had seen too much. Uh, and it's a tragic story. Uh, but uh, the, the moral of the story is, you know, don't kiss your sister. <laughs> You know, basically, uh, which was a, 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 a bit of a horrific uh, act. Uh, our families give us a lot, and a lot of it's good, and some of it's not so good. Where do I come from? Uh, you know, who are my people? How do I believe as I believe, and what do they have to do with it? Are my behaviors my own behaviors? Or are they someone else's that have been kind of impressed upon me? Uh, crazy runs in the family. Look how that boy drinks. He's his father's son, all right? If I divorce my wife, will she still be my cousin? I guess I'll die from cancer. Everyone else in my family does. Uh, uh, then there are two types of McCarrens, and I'm thinking about my mother's family now, non-drinkers and drunks. I've never met a McCarran who could hold his or her liquor. Does violence run in families too? Uh, seems to in some branches of mine. So how do we, uh, how do we uh, discover this stuff? Well, hey, Ma, the story of the lady who was cooking dinner one time, uh, and her daughter comes in and says, why do we cut the ends off the ham? And mom tells her, well, you know, I cut the ends off the ham uh, because that's how you cook ham. You cut the ends off, you put it in the pan, you put the ends aside to put in the beans, and then you garnish the ham and you set the oven to whatever, and you put it in there and you bake it, and that's how you make ham. And the little girl said, oh, okay. Uh, and she burned off and uh, just began to uh, worry mom. So she called her mom and said, hey, mom, why do we cut the ends off the ham? Uh, and her mom says, that's the way you make ham. You cut the ends off and save those for the beans and then you garnish the ham and you know in the pan and set the oven and put it in and that's how you make ham. Uh, and so mom said, okay. Uh, but now her mom's bugged by it, so she calls grandma uh, and uh, says, uh, grandma, why do we cut the ends off of the ham? And grandma says, a habit. When I married your uh, dad, I didn't have a pan big enough to, cut the, uh, to cook a ham in, so I had to cut the ends off to make it fit. Moral of the story, is two generations back, this behavior emerged and it had a purpose and a, at that time for emerging, for being there. Uh, but two generations later, the behavior's being repeated, but the purpose for the behavior has been lost. You don't need it anymore. Now you got a pan big enough to cook the, uh, to cook the ham in. Who am I? Uh, this is a genogram of uh, my family. It's pretty small on my screen anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, I can't, as a matter of fact, this is my uh, father's uh, people up here that I'm looking at. And then uh, uh, up here, over here, is uh, my mother's people. 
and down here is my immediate family, uh, my, my family of origin, and down here my siblings. Uh, so my uh, grandfather, uh, Andrew, World War I veteran, went off to fight the war. He and Ellie Mae uh, Bushart got uh, divorced, and she married Russell Sanders, and he married Mary. Uh, from his union with Ellie Mae, they had one child, and that was my father, Roy. Uh, and Roy was not raised in the family. He was uh, in this household. He was raised by my Aunt Katie. Uh, when uh, uh, my uh, uh, grandmother remarried, they had uh, a bunch of kids, and they were uh, my father's half-siblings over here. My dad met my mother, and she came from this side of the family. Mary Aletha, Aletha Way married uh, uh, Franklin McCarran, uh, and they had a bunch of kids: Leonard uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I mean Bill and Leonard, and then my mother Annie Mo Modeling. These were Irish people. They had some weird names, uh, like Annie Modeline, Buford, uh, uh, Wayman, uh, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and anyway, so uh, uh, she, uh, my mother grew up. She married Arthur Burke, uh, who was a Pacific War veteran. Uh, and uh, they didn't have any children, and he was killed, and she married uh, my father. Now, uh, out of this group of people, uh, there are no alcoholics up here. There is one over here. My grandfather and his wife were, uh, his second wife were both alcoholic, uh, as was my father. Uh, as was Arthur Burke. So my mother married two alcoholics. Uh, but she came uh, from uh, an alcoholic uh, couple. And Bill was an alcoholic, and Leonard was an alcoholic, and Truett was an alcoholic. Uh, Nadine was not. No, Buford was. Nadine was not. Uh, Faye was, uh, Mary Esther was not, and Wayman was not. Uh, so, uh, out of this group here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14 alcoholics right there. Uh, uh, and this is something that you can find in a genogram. Now, if you're doing a genogram, how do you know if someone was an alcoholic or not? This is a question that I uh, used to get a lot when I was doing these all the time. And my response is, we're not going to court. This isn't something that you have to prove in a court of law. This is just for your own enlightenment. It's for your own edification. So if you think they were alcoholic, that's good enough. Uh, you can ask someone, but uh, as uh, some of us know already, if you start uh, asking people about uh, family members and how the family functions and stuff, you can get shot down right quickly, especially if they think you're doing it for class. Now, who is this Bushart guy that he wants to know this stuff about our family? Well, it doesn't matter uh, uh, to me what you tell me about your family. It's not like I'm going to put it on the uh, 6 o'clock news, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway... Uh, some people get a shutdown response like that. But if you can see things like also uh, looking down through here, uh, cancer on both sides of the family. Uh, Ellie May uh, lived to be 103 years old and died of natural causes. Russell died of a stroke. Uh, there was cancer and stroke in here. Uh, cancer, 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 can uh, stroke, 
uh, car wreck, cancer, car, uh, uh, cancer, I'm having a tough time saying cancer, uh, cancer, 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 uh, you get my drift. Uh, and sometimes wondering about violence. Uh, Grandfather Franklin was killed by a hit and run driver uh, walking down the road one night. Uh, it was ruled hit and run, accidental death. Uh, the family is almost uh, uh, universally sure that it was murder. Someone saw Franklin walking down the side of the road and uh, nailed him because they had a reason to. Uh, my grandfather was a bit of a violent man. He would shot several people. Uh, and um, there were a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, given the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, over here, I mean, given the opportunity to get him back, they uh, would have. His oldest son, William, uh, was out drinking one night, my Uncle Bill, and uh, I, I never met him. He died before I was born, uh, but... Uh, his best friend beat him to death with a hammer in a fight over a woman. Uh, my uncle Leonard died of a stroke. Uh, uncle Truett died in a car wreck. Uh, the uh, uh, Indo Nadine was not, uh, uh, and Buford died of cancer. Uh, Nadine died of cancer, but she was married to a violent man. and. Uh, uh, who was uh, abusive to her and her kids. And so uh, uh, there was that, uh, an element, uh, a tendency uh, among the women to not be alcoholics themselves, but to marry alcoholics. Arthur Burke, from everything, I, I've ne never met him. He died before I was born. But from everything I understand, uh, he was... Uh, uh, suffered from PTSD. He, uh, my mother always said that he was, uh, you know, way different when he come back from the war, uh, fighting the Japanese in the in the Pacific, uh, and he came back violent and drunk, uh, pretty much a constant drunk. Tried to murder uh, Leonard and Buford uh, because they wouldn't help him kill a man. Uh, and uh, he, um, my grandfather shot him to death, and my mother held a grudge against Grandpa for, for that for a long time. Uh, she uh, was not a drinker, and she said the only alcohol she ever tasted was on the lips of her husband's. Uh, the, um, uh, the, but she had Howard and uh, Charles and uh, James and Roy, who were all drunks and drug users, and you know that was the way it went. Uh, this is that uh, a little closer look at uh, at, at them, and uh, when you um, and you can see that we um, had uh, a lot of chemical dependency and uh, and violence and stuff. The perfect family uh, doesn't exist in the United States. Probably not. If it did, maybe it's uh, it's uh, Homer and Marge and the kids. Uh, think about it. You know, uh, Marge is a stay-at-home mom. She takes care of the kids. Homer's got a good job at the nuclear power plant where he works, puts his hours in, brings home a good paycheck. Uh, they have a house in the suburb, uh, three kids, a dog and a cat. Uh, they go to church every Sunday uh, and uh, occasionally get drunk. And, you know, uh, Homer likes to choke Bart every once in a while. Uh, but, uh, you know, they kind of embody uh, the idea that uh, families in America should be mom and dad and the, and the kids and they should cohabitate and, uh, you know, 
partner up on taking care of the kids and everything. Uh, but in reality, that's not how the American family is. We have um, a, a relatively high divorce rate, still around 50% of first marriages end in divorce. Uh, which makes most of the kids in America the product of a broken home. Uh, and uh, conjoined families where there's yours, mine, and ours, where uh, uh, kids who are living in the home with a, a set of parents today may be half-siblings or step-siblings. Uh, that um, uh, so they don't quite fit in the mold of mom, dad, uh, and the uh, and the kids anymore. A lot of kids grow up in single parent homes. A problem that we see uh, with our families uh, that we work with are uh, kids whose parents are in jail or in prison, or you know they've been taken away from their parents and put in foster homes. So uh, the. Uh, the genograms can get convoluted sometimes, but the, the genogram is basically a way to illustrate relationships for your uh, clients uh, and provide them a structure and a way to talk about uh, their stories in a way that's um, useful to them. And there's some more templates there. Uh, so. Uh, that's really uh, all I have to say about the, about the genograms. So, um, and, uh, and, it was, and it was sketchy. So, uh, as they used to say on Outer Limits, I will now can return control of your screen to you. <laughs> you, know, you can do what you want with it. Uh, talk to you again soon. Bye.